Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 330, featuring the fourth installment of my interview with Mr. Rob Irving. A lot of great stuff in this segment. We talk about Lord of the Rings, uh, Fellowship of the Ring, uh, what went wrong there. Uh, we also talk about the Gizmondo. We talk about Wing Commander 4, uh, a canceled game called Prowler, and uh, the uh, future of NASA, <laughs> the uh, space program and uh, space tourism, with a nod towards a certain... Richard Garriott. A lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Rob Irving. Well, let's see, when did you do this mech game, this Prowler game? Prowler, oh, that was a cool game. It's a shame that that was already when Origin was kind of in its downward spiral, because for some reason EA bought us and thought, hey, maybe now that we own you, you guys could like keep a schedule and a budget. And of course, not our strong suit at Origin. Um, so yeah, Prowler was one of them that, that didn't survive because no one could figure out if it would sell anything or not. But it was, I mean, it was a mech game. It was giant mechs that would sink into the ground. I mean, okay. it, how did it compare to say something like Mech Warrior? Or a... um, I would call it a arcadey version of Mech Warrior. Um, you know, not as much realism to it. Uh, but realism air quotes, um, but. Yeah, it was really, it was kind of like the wing commander of mech games. It's, it's the best way to put it, I think, that we were trying for a little, a, a, you know, a stronger story than most mech games would have, because most mech games, it's just like, just go out there and shoot things. Here's your briefing. The end. You're a giant robot. Um, at the end. <laughs> yeah, you're in a robot, he's in a robot, kill that robot. That, that, you don't need much more than that, but we, you know, we were going for more story and a little more arcadey feel and a little less, I mean, those mech games do tend to be a little more semi for the most part, I'll call it semi, because certainly the Battletech games are pretty pretty hardcore. Not to be so. confused with the Sims. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, not that kind of semi, which I, I, another game market that I don't understand at all. I'm like, I'm going to go home and play Life? That doesn't even make sense. <laughs> yeah, when you put it that way, I... <laughs> that's a depressing thought. <laughs> So I always felt like that game was a little depressing. It's sort of like I never got into SimCity that much, although I thought the building stuff was super cool until they put in the monsters so you could stomp your city. And then I loved it. I'm like, okay, now it makes sense to me. Now it's a game. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to watch real people do real things. That's not really what I'm here for. I'm, I'm here for entertainment. <laughs> okay, well, this, you know, says the guy that makes all the ultra-realistic flight simulators. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> I live in all the worlds, one time or another. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like the, the little boy in us, right? That always wanted to fly the attack helicopter, or the you know. Yep. Oh yeah, I I wanted to I wanted to go to the moon when I was a kid. I definitely wanted to go to the moon. I still wanted to go to the moon when I went into college, but then they, you know aerospace after, engineering. I guess that's what that yeah. was. On. After the Challenger, though, they they were you know they were very down on the whole job market thing when I was going to my you know my counselors, my career counselors. Mm -hmm. They're like, There's, you're going to build fighter jets or nothing, basically." And I'm like, "That's not what I want to do." It was it was a really bad time for the space program. I mean, it was just the, I, I my timing was awful. That was one of the other things that influenced my decision to leave engineering was that it was just the wrong time. And then you know, ten years later. Here comes all the stuff I wanted to do. We've got a space station up there, and we're going to Mars. And those were the things I wanted to do. But that, at the time, no one felt like there was really much chance for that. And the space program was getting no money. And, you know, it just, it, it was it was bad timing. If I had been five years earlier or five years later, I might have still stayed an engineer. <laughs> Did you ever get to talk to Richard Gary about his I have never gotten to talk to him about it. Richard is so cool to talk to about pretty much anything. He's yeah. quite quite the good conversationalist. But yeah, I've I've always wanted to ask him about that, but I haven't run into him in a while. So uh, I'll have to go by and, and check in on what they are doing over there anyway at some point. Then I can ask him about his his rocket ship. <laughs> I found it funny that the guy who did the the fantasy games got in a spaceship. Yeah, you think it'd be Chris space, Roberts? Not, yeah, why why didn't Chris go to the moon or whatever? <laughs> I think he's got a, he's got he's got more than enough money to to go now, right? I would think so. You know, I, I would think that he should he should be in a rocket ship too at some point. I think that makes good sense. I, mean, I was thinking about this this interview earlier. With this I knew this topic would come up, and I was there. There all these complaints about buying all these Russian rockets, and the, why don't we have why don't we have rockets? You know, 
Yeah. Yeah. Why don't we have? Uh, that who's is to blame? Question. Yeah. yeah. Why? Why do we? Why don't we have our own rockets? Why do we? Do we need Russian ones? It's like, well, they do it better. Well, why don't we do it better? That, that's what it all comes back around to. Well, the, the answer to that is do it better. But yeah, I guess we, we just don't want to spend in that department. So we'll just buy Russian ones. There you go. Space program is, is not what it used to be, that's for sure. Although the Mars rover is so cool. <laughs> yeah, you're almost tempted to say the Russians won the space race after all, right? There. The Slova said they're like the turtle, the tortoise, you know, that won the race. True. Well, now, you know, the Chinese are catching up because they got their rockets now and are doing okay with their program. So we just, we haven't felt the need since it's like, well, we get to the moon first. The end, you know, I guess. I mean, the space shuttles got decommissioned. I thought that was cool too. We needed a new space shuttle. Nope. No space shuttle. Sorry. Where's the innovation in America's space program? Where is it? Where indeed. <laughs> Just a couple of last questions here for you. Uh, so what about this uh, Warriors of Might and Magic game? I, I love the Might and Magic series. I love the Hero no. series. <laughs> That's well, one of those you, games. I was hoping I wouldn't ask about this. What, what? <laughs> I wasn't sure if you would or not. You never. Can, it, it was it was a weird time. I know you didn't think life. it worked out very well. Huh? It was not the most successful game ever. It's true. Um, it was... Okay, it was a job. I, I, I needed a job. I, there was a, a time after Origin that I kind of just chilled for a month or two. I'm like, okay, now I need a job. And that one was available. <laughs> so Warriors of Might and Magic was understandable. I knew what they were trying to do because they were trying to take a very successful RPG franchise and make more action-y game out of it. You know, a console RPG, I mean, it's a RPG light at that point. But yeah, oh, a console yeah. version of that. Because they were trying to branch out. Um, and, you know, 3DO had a limited set of, of successful franchises. I mean, half of what they did was Army Men, which was another one I got to work on, but <clears throat> we won't talk about that. Um, but yeah, so Warriors of Might and Magic was a really light RPG for, for the 3DO. And... Sounds like the whole concept was flawed. Would would you go that far? It might might have been a little bit, yeah. Um, so it wasn't wasn't the best idea ever. Um, and it, it was on the 3DO, so that didn't help it. Um, I think it would have done better on on a Windows or DOS, I guess at that time. It might have done, yeah, with a little better performance. Certainly, that could have helped. But I mean, part of it, the game was pretty thin and i mean hey i'm partially responsible for that but there was just so much we could do with it and you know it, it it's not one of the titles i'm proudest of for sure <laughs> but uh again it was a job it got me a free 3do i got to play lots and lots of return fire <laughs> not, not to kick a man when he's down but <laughs> oh no but when now <laughs> So no, nobody really played that, I guess, right? But the the the, he, the Wing Tens Commander Four seems to be a sore. Uh, Wing Commander Four was not a bad. Thing. You said you got just, criticized for you. Uh, people were were a little um, frustrated by the, the the ground missions. So the story on Wing Commander Four is I they borrowed me for a couple of weeks because no one else remembered how to use the editor from Strike Commander to build terrain <laughs> stuff. Because I mean, they've been hemorrhaging employees for a while. Yes, Origin Origin had some some uh, serious turnover. I, I, one of the 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 going jokes around Origin was we create jobs at other companies because the <laughs> great worlds was the. But yeah, I mean, I was I was employee number one hundred two at Origin, I believe, and when I left, I was twentieth in seniority. So, that that says a lot about the turnover. You know, that was seven years in. 80 people who left ahead of me. If you just stayed on a couple of weeks, you could have been the head of yeah. the company. Right? Yeah. Well, I got laid off with Richard, so, you know, they, they laid off a lot of experienced people that in that particular Great Christmas Massacre. But, yeah, the thing about Wing 4 is that they asked me to do these ground missions. I really didn't have a lot of, you know, association with that game. I wasn't really, you know, on, on very much in the know as to what they were doing. So all they did is, say, you know, he make some ground missions for us. So I made some ground missions for them. Is it my fault they were super hard? I didn't have to test it. it was, I, I was off the team again by the time they got around to testing it. So yeah, apparently some people felt like the ground missions were a little bit hard. Or maybe a lot that bit hard. It doesn't seem like that. I mean, too hard. That's kind of a... 
you think, uh, what does that even I, mean? I mean <laughs> this means you need to train more. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you an opportunity to excel. It's not that's, winning that's, lieutenant, you know. It's... Yeah, exactly. I mean, honestly, if you think about it, the sense of accomplishment you get from beating something super hard, like, you know, a Dark Souls, for instance, where this game is too darn hard. I've thrown my controller 18 times, and, you know, but when you beat it, that's the game you feel the biggest sense of accomplishment. Easy games are like, well, this is fun and all, but uh, I'm not challenged. So I was just trying to challenge them. I felt like maybe the space missions weren't going to be hard enough, so the ground missions needed to be harder. I'm, I'm sticking to that story. Yeah, that's... I've, got, I've got no problem with that. You know, I like a difficult game. Yeah. So yeah, there was there there was definitely some complaining that that some of the ground missions were hard, but eh, I, I, it was it wasn't my fault. That's that's what I'm going to say. Also, it wasn't my fault. I, I got dragged into it. It it, it was just a, I happen to have knowledge that other people don't, so I'm doing this for them situation <laughs> oh, I'll, we'll take that, See, that i'm just that... i'm just gonna head this this off with uh, i'll just i'll just say this word and you can sort of go with this where you where you will gizmondo ah! oh gizmondo that is one of the more ludicrous tales <laughs> the sad thing about gizmondo is they had a really great product but unfortunately, that wasn't apparently the goals of the, the higher ups. You know, they, their goal was to you know bilk investors out of as much money as they could, as opposed to bringing this really cool product. I mean, the first Gizmondo was an okay handheld console. The second one that we had only seen the prototype of was an iPhone. Ten years before there was an iPhone, basically, touch screen everything. I mean, it was a super advanced device, and all they had to do was actually make it. And they would have been making money, all that money that they wanted. Instead, they were just figuring out new and creative ways to take the money. But, I mean, the team was a good team that I worked with. I worked with a really bu- a bunch of great guys here in Austin. And I, I just felt so sad that, you know, this, this was out of our control. And all these great people ended up without jobs and without paychecks because, you know, a bunch of crooks decided to start a company that we ended up joining. Well, it is sad. Yeah, we, we it's, had it's actually... hard as hell to do any research on it too, because every time you type in Gizmondo into Google, it keeps auto correcting you to Gizmodo. And I like had to play with this thing, like, please, I actually want Gizmondo. There is actually uh, the there is was an article on Wired, I think that it was that did um, that talked about it. It was like a big long spread after um, the the uh, CFO wrecked the Ferrari Enzo in California. Um, that that led to this huge investigation, which resulted in this great, I think it was a Wired article, about Gizmondo. And it's the best telling of the story. I mean, really, once somebody's told that story that well, I can't top it. You know, it's just they, they did a perfect job of reporting that, the, the history of Gizmondo. Did you have to testify on that, any of this stuff? Or were you, left alone? Did, were you had, asked to testify on any of this? No, no, no. It never got down to our level. Uh, I, I mean... All I can say is that we built two teams, and one with the, the second team, we had to lay off three weeks after we ha- hired them. So, you know, the the small tragedies uh, encompassed by our little office, you know, that that's that's really all that we touched. But the the bigger tragedy of the, the company itself is was pretty far from us. So I was listening to this interview you did with Adam and the, you know the, the guys at the Fragment uh, Fragments of Silicon. A podcast, mm. and I was really intrigued when you started talking about the Lord of the Rings. Oh, I knew you were going to go there. I knew it. Well, it just, I couldn't stop thinking about, you know, <laughs> I was like walking back home and I was thinking about all these licensing issues with the book and the movie and the likenesses. And I mean, what a mess. And that, it just, just kind of got me wondering, like, what, how does all this legal <laughs> stuff impact your job when you're just trying to design a good game? It's a complicated, complicated thing. I mean, that is certainly the hardest license I've ever had to work on. Um, I mean, part of it is just it sort of mirrors the very bizarre nature of the Lord of the Rings franchise itself in that there's a legal company that's separate from the family and they own different things. And this is how I guess they divided up the license in the first place. And we got the movie, got a set of games. And so Universal in its wisdom, decided to license the books. Well, they divide the IP up 
about yes. nine lords and <laughs> I think I've heard this story exactly. before. Yeah, it made, it made no sense at the time. I'm like, oh yes, I want to work on Lord of the Rings. That was a, that was a given. Course, and then I'm like, yeah. books? Wait. So how much how much difficulty is this going to cause us? And they're like, well, well so all just, you have just to, to set make... the stage a little bit. So you 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 had the book IP. Yes, we had the book IP, but and, not the uh, other. EA had the movie IP. Yes. So we are working on the same story as them. But it can't look anything like the movie, which, of course, you're going to have a hard time with Gandalf not looking like a guy in gray with a pointy hat and a white beard. You know, I mean, how much different you can we make even that? Give him a beard. Wow. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, so, no, yeah, no we had to stay away from anything that looked like the movie. And we, what we tried to do with that is we at least tried to tell parts of the story that the movie hadn't told for Fellowship of the Ring. Um but uh, it just – we had so much work just avoiding those mi- that minefield of the movie part that, that I think that it diffused the focus on the actual game. And mm. the end result was not something that was really the best game ever. Um, I, I would say that, that the PS2 version came out better than the – the uh, Xbox version, but um, and they were both better than Warriors of Might and Magic. <laughs> but that's that oh. scale, you know, that's like an eight on Rotten Tomatoes or a twelve on Rotten Tomatoes sort of thing. So, um, so you, I mean, what if you hadn't had to worry? But what if they had had the license to the movie? I mean, what would it have been? How different <sighs> would it have been? I don't know. I mean, that's it, it's. I think that is one of the games that I worked on that, in hindsight, suffered from trying to tell too much story. As opposed to, you know, you looked at the EA game that came out from the movie and it was just like, beat up a thousand orcs. Done. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, that made sense. Yeah. That game is easy to grasp and, and fun to play, and ours is a little more laborious, which is true to the book in the sense that The Fellowship of the Ring is really just a very, very slow travel log. I mean, nothing happens in that book. You know, people it's... forget that all the time, and then you go back and reread the actual books, and you're like, well, I just read five pages about the scenery, you know? Exactly. It's like, how much time does it take you to describe snow? There's a lot of it. Okay, we get it. Go on. <laughs> and what are we going to do today? Walk some more? Okay. <laughs> not really being compelled right now. I mean, all the cool stuff happens in the second and third book. So... The, the first book kind of, you know, wasn't really made for a video game, unfortunately. I mean, the fact that there wasn't really supposed to be a first, second, and third book is completely immaterial. But It was supposed to be just one big novel, right? Yeah, and, and they wouldn't do it. The publisher said, we just can't do that. Tolkien was not happy about it. But that's why the, the novels are, the pages are numbered sequentially in the three novels. So, because he refused to acknowledge that it was anything but one book. So that's, See, that's what we the got. There's the factoid of the show there, right? There we go. They, they, if you learned something today, I've done my job. That's that's it. That's our factoid of the day. But, yeah, it's it's just – if you think about it, it really isn't the greatest thing to build a game out of. Uh, and, you know, you can sort of tell. I mean, you know, not that I was the designer on that game, but certainly as as the producer, I had some, some sway there. And it just it, – it didn't ever come together quite – Quite the way I would have hoped, but so if somebody today was like, you know, we want to give you a couple million to work on this Fellowship of the Ring reboot, you know? Yeah, <laughs> no, oh, no thanks. Oh. <laughs> that would be probably easier now, because after the Hobbit, I think everyone's a little <clears throat> little turned off of the movie franchise. So, because that was a disaster. Yeah. Oh, even Benedict, so... even old Benedict Cumberbatch couldn't, you know. <sighs> so so sad. I mean, I, I, I was cringing as soon as I heard there were going to be three Hobbit movies, and it, when I finally got around to watching them, because I boycotted them for a long time, but I finally got around to watching them all when they were on HBO, and I was right. It was, it was tragic. Yeah, well, they could probably get another six movies out of the Silmarillion. How's that? The ah, that's the one they don't have. Separate license. Unfinished Tales. There we go. <laughs> yep, see, more complicated licensing stuff. That's one of the things that – that's the reason we have three Hobbit movies, though, is because they still had the appendices from The Lord of the Rings. We haven't used that content yet. Make more Hobbit movies. 
That's but yeah, they don't have the Silmarillion. They that, for some reason that that license is separate. I, and again, with the complexity of the entire token estate thing and the legal mojo surrounding it, it it's just I don't I I can't comprehend it myself. <laughs> That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with the uh, fifth and final part of this interview with Mr. Irving. Uh, I discovered I've actually got plenty of enough material for another episode, so uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, probably afterward, I will be looking at XCOM 2, which is a game I'm absolutely in love with at the moment. And that will be followed up with uh, uh, Wartik, the father of these settlers. So a lot of great stuff, and I owe it all to your continued support. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for supporting the show. Now, if you are one of those many people who have uh, wanted to support the show uh, through Patreon, but been putting it off, you know, maybe next week, maybe the week after, whatever, you know, please consider uh, just going ahead and uh, go ahead and doing that now. Very close to that $500 threshold so we can get the transcripts back. It really mean a lot to me. And if, uh, you know, if you watch all these shows, uh, you know, <laughs> you should feel a little obligated, right, to help out. Uh, if you can't afford to uh, support the show financially, I also appreciate, of course, uh, just letting other people know about it. It all means a lot to me, and I'm very, very grateful for your help. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? Hey, uh, what time is it? Uh, well, Stig wrote in. It's probably the most exciting piece. So this is uh, Baldur's Gate Siege of Dragonspear now has an official release date. We'll see if they stick to that. Uh, March 31st. So a little over a month away. Actually, uh, less than a month away. Uh, not very far off. So go ahead and start saving up your money, I suppose. Uh, also, with that announcement, uh, they have a, a collector's edition physical copy of this thing. That's 130 bucks. But it pretty much has everything in the kitchen sink as far as collectors uh, could be concerned. There's a cloth map, of course, a collectible coin, even an amulet. Uh, so it's quite a bunch of stuff there. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, if $130, uh, yeah, uh, that's a that's a lot of money, but you know it's a lot of uh, a lot of cool stuff. So I thought I'd pass that along. Well, let me know if you get that, by the way. Uh, let's see what else. There's also an interview with Josh Sawyer. Remember I had him on uh, Matt Chat not too long ago. Now he's on a show called Acts of the Blood Podcast. I think I got that right. He's on there talking about uh, Pillars of Eternity a year later. So I'll post a link to that podcast so you can check that out. And uh, finally, Humble Bundle has a $100 worth of Pathfinder comics. So I think these are comics as well as some, uh, I think I saw some maps there as well, and some kind of figurine. Uh, diagrams. I'm not quite sure what I was uh, seeing there. But anyway, this the, all this stuff is available for only 15 bucks. And if, like, uh, if you've uh, done the hum Humble Bundle thing before, you know, if you pitch in a little more than that, uh, you get quite a bit of uh, extra stuff too. So that, that looked pretty cool. Don't normally talk a lot about comics here, but, you know, <laughs> it's Pathfinder, so I guess it's okay. All right, what about that ale of the week? Uh, oh, wait, uh, I'll, I should add this. Uh, one little extra bit of news. I've got four copies of that gameplay DVD left, so I'm selling those, remember, for 10 bucks uh, plus whatever the shipping uh, is to your country or your address. If you want one of those, it's a signed copy. Uh, just go to the eBay link in the show notes and grab that, because uh, once those are gone, they're gone forever. Okay, here we have the uh, Swamp Pop, <laughs> Revenge of the Swamp Pop. Uh, this is a uh, Praline Cream Soda. So you've probably had some pralines before. Uh, this is the cream soda flavor with those things. <laughs> Let's see what else. Made with pure Louisiana cane sugar. GMO free, caffeine free. <laughs> bells, pralines, bells, pralines. With the refrain of the pralineers, pralineers. In the early 19th century French Quarter of New Orleans, as they steadily fan their delicate candies with swamp pop, no, palmetto leaves to protect them from the stifling Louisiana heat. That is no exaggeration. Uh, that is, uh, Louisiana heat is like a, uh, it's like carrying around a sopping wet electric blanket turned up to high uh, on you at all times. It's, it's, it's very oppressive. 
Let's see, Swamp Pop Praline Cream Soda combines the warm brown sugar, toasty butter, and pecan, uh, pecan flavors of this Creole confection with the traditional cream soda recipe to create a whole new delicious way to beat the Louisiana heat. No palmetto leaves required. It may have you shouting, Bell's uh, Praline Cream Soda. <laughs> Bay, Bell's, <laughs> Bell. oh man. Anyway, let's see, Lafayette, Louisiana. Carbonated water, cane sugar, natural flavors. Oh, guess what? Qualuja extract. Hey, hey. Okay, let's see. Anything else there? Questions? Okay. Anyway, let's get this Swamp Pop Praline Cream Soda open and see what it's all about. All right, so what I got here is some of the Swamp Pop Praline Cream Soda with premium Louisiana sugar cane. Ah, this really, really smells, man, it just really smell, it smells like a really good cream soda, but there's definitely that uh, scent of pralines as well, if you've ever had those. Wonderful little uh, confection. Man, you just, I wish you could smell this. It smells uh, really, really good. If it smell, if it tastes as good as it smells, we're going to have a clear winner here. <laughs> Let's give it a taste though. You get a kind of a sweet buttery taste. And this is very, very sweet, as you would expect from that, uh, all that talk about sugarcane and pralines. You definitely have that sort of praline flavor here on the back end. It's a uh, kind of a light, uh, say a light kind of crisp flavor on this. Uh, a little on the sweet side, I have to say. It's, it's very sweet. If you like uh, really, really sweet sodas, I think you would like this. Uh, there's a little bit of a kind of a buttery, um, I kind of, you get sort of that butter and pralines on the back end there. Uh, it's not bad. I'll try it one more time here. You know, all in all, it's a very solid cream soda. You know, cream sodas usually are pretty, uh, pretty sugary. Uh, this one's definitely no exception. This is even more sugary than the typical cream soda, if you can believe that. Uh, I'm going to go uh, four out of five drinking horns on this. A swamp pot praline cream soda. It's really good. It's very, very sweet. I can't see you drinking more than maybe one of these or you'd have some kind of uh, seizure from the sugar. Uh, but otherwise, it's uh, quite nice. That's uh, a four out of five for the swamp pot praline cream soda. All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was uh, looking for quotes, of course, from a certain J.R.R. Tolkien uh, since he came up in this uh, segment. And I really, uh, I really like this quotation. I hadn't heard it before. Uh, so that was, uh, I thought I'd seen all of Tolkien's quotes, uh, but this was a new one to me, and I think it's pretty cool. It goes something like this. A pen is to me as a beak is to a hen. See you guys next week. The answer to everything, life, the universe, and everything is 42.